good evening, friends, and welcome to the Temenos Academy and to the Lincoln Center. And our very warm thanks, as always, to Alan Parker and his team for their generous hospitality. Um, it's a very great pleasure tonight um, to announce our speaker um, for two reasons, really. One is that I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Malcolm Geit once again to Temenos, um, a magnificent speaker whom many people will know already. Secondly, because I am also, if I may say so, equally delighted that we are about to listen to a talk on Owen Barfield, um, who is probably the most underrated philosopher of the 20th century, certainly the most important British philosopher of the century, and about whom we need to know much more. As for Malcolm Geit, um, he's a poet, a theologian, a critic. Um, he is chaplain and by fellow of Girton College, Cambridge, um, which is particularly good because, of course, Girton College has a link with the origins of Temenos, having been Kathleen Lane's college. Um, Malcolm has lectured in both theology and English literature. He's published five volumes of poems, as well as an important meditation on the nature of poetic inspiration and spirituality um, under the title of Faith, Hope, and Poetry. Um, he says that his interests are in the interface between spirituality and poetry, and particularly in the imagination as a truth-bearing faculty. Um, I've just heard from Malcolm that his new book on Coleridge is now complete, um, has been copy edited, and should be appearing very soon from which publisher? From Hodder and Stoughton. From Hodder and Stoughton, yes, to whom all honour is due, because it's going to be a very fine book. And it has colour illustrations, including um, the very rare coloured versions of Mervyn Peake's illustrations to the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. So um, we await that with excitement. However, this evening's topic is Owen Barfield. And I'm delighted to welcome Malcolm to speak on Owen Barfield, Knowledge, Poetry and Consciousness. Malcolm. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, there we are, knowledge, poetry and consciousness. Three little topics we should be able to polish off in an evening. Uh, I say that deprecatingly, of course, because we are coming as we speak of those things to the brink of mysteries, mysteries which I think Barfield himself uh, explored profoundly, articulated memorably, and uh, about a knowledge about which he advanced considerably. Um, but neither he in his writing nor we in our deliberations this evening will ever come to the end <laughs> of that mystery, which is poetry. Um, and. Uh, of the way it might influence knowledge and the way knowledge and consciousness are related, all topics that Barfield considered really deeply. So I want to start by saying that the name of Owen Barfield is most often introduced as an adjunct to, almost a background, for discussion of C.S. Lewis. Now, he was part of the famous Oxford grouping around Lewis known as the Inklings, and he's sometimes been referred to with justice as the first and last Inkling. Uh, the link with Lewis is understandable, since they were uh, lifelong friends. Poetic diction, an absolutely key Barfield text, was dedicated to Lewis. Lewis's first great academic work, The Allegory of Love, was dedicated to Owen Barfield. Um, it's entirely understandable that they should link. Uh, be linked. And in fact, the pairing of Lewis and Barfield is very helpful for a deeper understanding of C.S. Lewis, especially of Lewis's poetry. And I think it can be said with some certainty that had it not been for the so-called Great War, uh, the, the friendly argumentative exchange in letters and in, in, in viva voce between Lewis and Barfield, had it not been for that, atheist Lewis, materialist Lewis of the early 20s uh, 
would never have come to understand, as he did, thanks to Barfield, that the imagination is a truth-bearing faculty and that he could take his imagination seriously. And without that understanding, we wouldn't have the Lewis we know at all. So it's certainly helpful to know a link between Barfield and Lewis for understanding Lewis in himself. However, I think the perpetual link between the two of them does Barfield a disservice. It associates him exclusively with the literary endeavours of the Inklings, and particularly with their efforts at orthodox Christian apologetics. Now, as I say, without doubt, his account of, Barfield's account of imagination is important um, for understanding Lewis, and uh, Barfield's book, Poetic Diction, is hugely influential not only on Lewis but also on Tolkien. Tolkien famously said that when he was lecturing on the history of language and on Anglo-Saxon and giving his Beowulf lectures whilst at the same time realizing that language was generative of worlds as he worked on his own legendarium, Tolkien said that he'd be just about to say something in a lecture and he'd remember something that Owen Barfield had said and realized he couldn't say that. <laughs> He needed to rethink from Barfieldian principles, so there's no question that they helped the that he helped the Inklings and Lewis and Tolkien. But philology and literary criticism, which were the areas of strength of Lewis and Tolkien, and then the areas in which Barfield had helped them, are not actually the only thing that Barfield are about. They are only outer aspects of Barfield's deeper concerns as a philosopher and I think as a, as a sage, as somebody who had real wisdom to impart to his age, um, they were only an outer aspect of that. What were those deeper concerns? So I think the deepest concern of Owen Barfield's writing is with, to borrow a, a technical term from the philosophers, is with epistemology. Episteme, to know in Greek. Epistemology is the, the whole subject that it discusses, what is knowledge itself? When we say we know something, what kind of thing do we know? What is the relationship between the knower and the known? What are the assumptions we make about what is knowable and how it's known before we even begin to do the knowing? That's what epistemology is about. And I think as we come to a crisis in our own culture about the relationship between ourselves as subjects and subjective consciousness is looking out on an apparently dead, increasingly objectified world where we're also objectifying people in appalling ways and losing the sense of what personhood is. It's what Barfield has to say about the nature of knowledge that I think is most pertinent for, for the concerns of our own age. So I want to lift him, having acknowledged that context, that literary context, with the Inklings. I want, uh, for the course of this lecture, to lift him out of that and try and give a bit of an overview of his wider concerns, and particularly to think about how he might have something to say about the development of modern science, uh, as well as the development of literature. So I want to take him out of literary, and of course the other circles in which he might be known and celebrated might be broadly called esoteric circles, and they have their proper interest but I want to lift him out of both of those circles and place him firmly in the public square <laughs> as somebody with whom everybody who is concerned about what is the case, uh, to, to borrow Wittgenstein's phrase, uh, everybody who's concerned about what is the case, what can we know, and how can we know it? I think Barfield is a vital person who's been ignored. Uh, so, so that's the context of what I'm trying to say. So why should we consider Barfield more widely? In particular, why should those concerned with the interface between science and religion, or science and spirituality, as well as um, uh, spirituality and poetry, pay him serious attention? Well, consider the following statement from Barfield. This, these are the opening sentences of Barfield's seminal essay, The Rediscovery of Meaning. Barfield writes, Amid all the, this is written in the, in the 70s. <laughs> Amid all the menacing signs that surround us in the middle of this 20th century, perhaps the one that fills thoughtful people with the greatest foreboding is the general sense of meaninglessness. It is this which underlies most of the other threats 
How is it that the more able man becomes to manipulate the world to his advantage, the less he can perceive any meaning in it? The more able he's able to manipulate, the less he perceives meaning. Now, does that strike a chord? So almost everyone, I think, will recognize that the crisis to which Barfield pointed, in fact, that was published in the 70s, he wrote the essay in the early 60s, has deepened since then. Barfield offers a very acute historical analysis in that essay, The Rediscovery of Meaning, of how it was that the increasingly detailed knowledge arising from the scientific revolution seemed simultaneously to evacuate the world of meaning. He observes that, and here I'm quoting that essay again, quote, the vaunted progress of knowledge, which has been going on since the 17th century, has been progress in alienation. The alienation of nature from humanity, which the exclusive pursuit of objectivity in science entails, was the first stage. And it was followed with the acceptance of man himself as a part of this nature so alienated, and therefore by the alienation of man from himself. This final and fatal step in reductionism occurred in two stages. First, his body, and then his mind. Newton's approach to nature was already, by contrast with the older scientific traditions, a form of behaviorism. And what has since followed has been its extension from astronomy and physics into physiology and, ultimately, psychology. It's really worth considering that. I'll lift my eyes from my script for the moment. If you think about uh, earlier writers, say, for example, Sir John Davies writing at the end of the 16th century in his beautiful court poem, Orchestra, which is about the making of the cosmos, in which he sees the cosmos entirely as a love-led dance. He sees it as tingling with consciousness. He sees the movement or motion of the heavenly bodies as participatory and conscious of something larger than itself. Now, Newton replaces that with an entirely materialized and objective version of things working on a law of gravity. It's not that the law of gravity wasn't there to begin with, but it's seeing it as the exclusive account of all things. That's what's meant by reductive thinking. And what he's saying is the, the, the cosmos that was once a conscious thing becomes a set of small items batting about meaninglessly together in the void. Yeah? But people said, well, never mind, that's that. At least we have this rich and suggestive inner life ourselves, so we're fine. And then we see our bodies as part of that machine. Then finally, we turn our attention to our brains. And because, precisely because we have voided what is out there of consciousness, <laughs> we find no means of giving an account in here of consciousness. The alienation of nature is followed by the alienation of body. And finally, the mind itself. So what follows from this prog progressive reductionism, as Barfield points out in his book Saving the Appearances, is not only the experience of alienation from the knowledge that we have itself, so we have the knowledge but it means nothing to us, but also the disintegration of knowledge in its widest sense into a series of narrow specialisms which have no common language and are incapable of communicating with each other. So in another prescient passage written in the 50s, uh, Barfield writes this. Science, with the progressive disappearance of original participation, is losing its grip on any principle of unity pervading nature as a whole and the knowledge of nature. The hypothesis of chance has already crept from the theory of evolution into the theory of the physical foundation of the Earth itself. But more serious, perhaps, than that is the rapidly increasing fragmentation of science. There is no science of sciences, no unity of knowledge. There is only an accelerating increase in that pigeonholed knowledge by individuals of more and more about less and less. Now, one may uh, take a view one way or another, agree or disagree, with what Barfield proposes as an answer to that problem of fragmentation of knowledge, but I think everybody will agree that the thing he is analyzing 
is happening and is happening to the detriment of our full embodied and wise response to the knowledge that we have. Barfield never quotes these lines, but I want to quote them myself at this point. Um, lines from Eliot's Choruses from the Rock, um, uh, written a bit before Ralph Barfield wrote this. Uh, you remember in that, Eliot uh, has the, the rock, uh, the stranger, the prophetic figure asking the questions, ask these two questions. Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge. It's interesting, isn't it? Where's the knowledge we've lost in information? Where's the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Long before the information age, before the whole massive technology of processing information in sort of bits and bytes, Eliot recognizes this hierarchy, that you can, the more information you have, you, the more you require knowledge to organize the information. Information is simply information, it's neutral. What do you do with the information? How does it fit together? What does it suggest? What is the whole that's suggested by the many parts? Knowledge is required for that. And they say we should be moving now from an information economy, which we're in, towards a knowledge economy. But once you've got the knowledge, what do you do with it? That's where you need wisdom. Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? What Eliot is suggesting there is that the more information we have, the more we require knowledge to organize it. But it also follows that the more knowledge we have, the more deeply we require wisdom to know what the knowledge is about and what to do with it. So in that passage that I quoted from Barfield, the accelerating increase in that pigeonholed knowledge by individuals of more and more about less and less, Barfield here exposes problems arising from positivist materialism, which will be felt most acutely by those concerned with the interplay uh, between science, psychology, and religion. Our experience of meaning, both in our own individual consciousness and our intuitions of collectively held meanings, simply as experiences in themselves, tend to resist this reductive atomizing into purely material interaction to which our current scientific paradigms might be pointing. Barfield is able to observe that our progress in alien, uh, to observe our progress in alienation, partly uh, because it's part of a deeper process that he investigated all his life, the process by which our mode of consciousness and therefore both the objects and the kinds of our knowledge have changed. Our mode of consciousness has changed, or as Barfield contends, evolved over time. As we shall see, Barfield contends that our current detached and therefore alienated mode of knowing is only one phase in the development of our consciousness. And this approach of Barfield's not fixing what we know and how we know it in terms of the way we do it now, but being aware of a deeper reach of how it was done and able at least to imagine a possibility of how it might be done. <laughs> that sets us free from the way we do it now and allows us to consider alternatives. This approach gives us the possibility of at least imagining another way of knowing, a way which does not necessarily exclude our present hard-won objectivity but rather integrates it with a more participative and meaningful way of knowing. Later in that same essay, The Rediscovery of Meaning, Barfield uses a metaphor drawn from the experience of language and reading to describe how we might move without loss beyond our present alienation. So here's a bit of speculation about the future from Barfield. He writes, it remains to be considered whether the future development of scientific man must inevitably continue in the same direction so that he becomes more and more a mere onlooker, measuring with greater and greater precision and manipulating more and more cleverly an earth to which he grows spiritually more and more a stranger. His detachment has enabled him to describe, weigh, and measure the process of, processes of nature and to a large extent control them. But the price he has paid has been the loss of his grasp of any meaning 
in either nature or himself. Penetration to the meaning of a thing or process, as distinct from the ability to describe it exactly, involves a participation by the knower in the known. The meaning of what I am writing is not the physical pressure of thumb and forefinger or the size of the inclines with which I form the letters. It is the concepts expressed in the words I'm writing. But the only way of penetrating to these is to participate in them, to bring them to life in your mind by thinking them. In the same way, if we want to know the meaning of nature, we must learn to read as well as to observe and describe. Is there any possibility of scientific man's ever recovering the old power to read whilst still retaining his hard-won treasure of exact observations and manipulative control? For no one would advocate a mere relapse into the past. Signs are not altogether wanting that there is such a possibility. I can't describe to you with what a thrill I read those words. Um, a long time ago now, I guess I read those words in the late 80s, sitting with a copy of The Rediscovery of Meaning in the University Library in Cambridge. And as I read those words, I mean, he drew my attention to the physicality of my reading and to the fact that I had an acute analysis of the angles of it. And he made me imagine the physical act of him writing it on the paper and how I could have spent ages just, as it were, geographically and chemically describing the ink on the paper. And then he reminded me that something else altogether was coming through it. And that something else altogether that he was saying to me at that moment, the kind of experience, almost of a kind of thrill of discovery as I read it. And then he made me look up you know, at the world around me and the movement of the stars and the heavens and the kind of beating of my own pulse and the physicality of the desk in front of me and said, do you suppose instead of simply observing that you might read it? And it called to my mind uh, from depths of, you know, where they'd been buried, some, some lines of Coleridge's that Coleridge had written in hope for his son when he was thinking of how his son would grow up in Frost at Midnight where he imagined Hartley, the little boy, going out into the landscape of the lakes and saying, you know, but thou, my child, shall wander like a breeze by lakes and shandy, sandy shores and beneath the crags of mountains. And then Coleridge famously said, so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters who doth teach himself in all things, and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit, and by giving, make it ask. That these things to be observed in nature, the phenomena, the appearances, were shapes and sounds, certainly. And we know a great deal more about them as shapes and sounds than we did in the 18th century or the 16th century. But actually, we don't know any more what Coleridge knew about them, let alone what Shakespeare knew about them in terms of what they say, the language that they are. So there's this great appeal. But in order for you to read anything, you, your mind must go out through the veil of the text into the author's mind, who is coming through the veil of the text to you, so that together you participate in the concept or the idea that it's being spoken of and achieve knowledge. It would be possible to discuss the text as a physical object till the cows came home as physical objects and not actually have perceived a single thing. And that is where he felt we were going in terms of the scientific revolution. So uh, I was thrilled to discover after, I, after this passage, this very passage prompted a memory of Coleridge. I, 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 this was the days before the internet, so you couldn't go like Google Barfield Coleridge. But I just went to the university paper catalogue and I looked at Barfield and saw there was a book called What Coleridge Thought, <laughs> um, which became a really important book for me. Uh, so I remember the thrill of, of, of first seeing this point. So it's not surprising that Barfield should draw this crucial metaphor from language. Language becomes a metaphor for the way we might read the whole world because it was as a philologist 
that Barfield first made his mark. His first two books, History in English Words and Poetic Diction, are both concerned with etymological history, with what changes in the meaning of long surviving words can tell us about earlier ways of thinking, earlier modes of consciousness. In a key passage in History in English Words, Barfield makes an analogy, I think a profound analogy, between the way the physical crust of the earth contains embedded evidence of earlier epochs, the fossils and fossil bones of the dinosaurs and so on, embedded evidence of earlier epochs, the way the physical crust contains though, and the way the earliest records of human language, the great epic poems from the heroic age, the sacred texts from all the world faiths, the way the earlier records of human language contain evidence, hard evidence, of a different way of knowing the world. This is what Barfield writes in History in English Words. It has only just begun to dawn on us that in our own language, the past history of humanity is spread out in an imperishable map, just as the history of the mineral earth lies embedded in the layers of its outer crust. But there is this difference between the record of the rocks and the secrets that are hidden in language. Whereas the former can only give us knowledge of outward dead things, such as forgotten seas or the bodily shapes of prehistoric animals, language has preserved for us the inner living history of man's soul. It reveals the evolution of consciousness. There's an absolutely key idea for Barfield that we have hard evidence that the very mode of our being conscious has changed and is changing. Now he wrote that in 1926 and in a sense everything he has written since is a development of that insight that our current mode of consciousness is not the same as it was when the words we are now using were first used, nor will it remain the same. We can learn from a previous, previously participative, meaning-drenched way of understanding and perhaps learn to recover a participative way of knowing. The period in which we happen to be living, in which we experience knowledge as detached and alienated, is only one fragment of time. But Barfield contends, we carry, all of us, within us, embedded in the language we use, the memory of another way of seeing the world. That is one of Barfield's core ideas. This idea that by finding out what words used to mean, you can get a different view of consciousness itself, is one he explains very clearly in a short passage in a later book called Speaker's Meaning. Here, Barfield makes a distinction between inner and outer. A thing can have an outer meaning, but also an inner meaning, which we now think of, we now, in our way of thinking, think of as a metaphorical meaning. But he's interested in why we have to choose, in our mode, between outer and inner. Why we have to choose between the literal and the metaphorical. And uh, why we can't have both at once to the enrichment of both. This is what Barfield writes in Speaker's Meaning. Words, which for us today have an outer meaning only, formerly had an inner meaning as well. Moreover, the process by which they have lost their inner meanings is clearly the obverse or correlative of the very process by which many other words have lost their outer meanings. Both processes may well be illustrated by the history of such terms as breath or air or wind, and spirit. For here, they happen to be sharply pointed by a well-known record from a period when they were not as yet divided. In the English version of St. John's Gospel, this is all Barfield, in the English version of St. John's Gospel, chapter three, we find the following three verses in which both terms, air, wind, breath, spirit, are employed alternately. John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Probably, this is still Barfield, probably most people read the first part of the verse, verse 8, as a metaphor comparing the Spirit with the wind. But if we turn to the Greek, we find it is not so. The same word, pneuma, is employed throughout. Though it has been rightly translated first as spirit, and then later as wind, and then again as spirit. In Hellenistic Greek, pneuma still conveyed the concomitant meanings, both. But the English translators had to split it into two words, one of which, spirit, has since lost its outer meaning. So spirit, spirit has a kind of abstract metaphysical meaning, but you, doesn't, you, know, you, don't, you can't put your hand on it. Wind, this is me explaining Barfield, wind is, you know, you, you, can, you can have put an anemometer up and get a reading, but you don't think it's a spiritual thing. Huh? When we see that an earlier life and culture didn't need two words for those two things, but insisted on one word for both, we recognize that they were apprehending a unity which we've lost. Is that, is that clear? So, um, so spirit has lost its outer meaning and wind has lost its inner meaning. <laughs> They've been split up. Um, for us, the wind, and the, so that's, that's the, the end of Barfield's comment. Now I'm commenting on this. For us, the wind only means the thing that blows. It doesn't mean anything spiritual at all. We split these two things up that were once apprehended together as a unity. However, what Barfield noticed is that when we read poetry, particularly poetry from these earlier periods, we can suddenly experience a change of consciousness. And for a moment at least, we can have a real knowledge of the world as seen from a different mode of consciousness. Indeed, in Barfield's key work, Poetic Diction, he goes so far as to define poetry as a felt change of consciousness. He was actually in the draft originally just saying a change of consciousness, and he was reading it out to C.S. Lewis, and Lewis said, no, you must say a felt change of consciousness. It's the experience of that. Oh, I can suddenly see something I didn't see before. I suddenly feel the inner has at last been restored to me of what was once before I read this poem, only the empty outer. That's what I felt, that change. So, uh, Barfield writes, I find myself obliged to define poetry as a felt change of consciousness, where consciousness embraces all my awareness of my surroundings at any given moment, and surroundings includes my feelings, by felt, I need to signify that the change itself is noticed or attended to. He elaborates on this definition a little later uh, in Poetic Diction using a very interesting analogy drawn from science. The phrase must be taken with some exactness. He's talking about the moment of appreciation, the moment you suddenly see the thing in a new way. Appreciation takes place at the actual moment of change. It's not simply that the poet enabled me to see with eyes and so to apprehend a larger and fuller world, but the actual moment of the pleasure of appreciation depends upon something rarer and more transitory. It depends upon the change itself. If I pass a coil of wire between the two poles of a magnet, I generate in it an electric current. But I only do so while the coil is positively moving across the lines of force. Current only flows when I'm bringing the coil in or taking it away. So it is with the poetic mood, which, like the passage from one plane of consciousness to another, it lives during the moment of transition and then dies. And if it is to be repeated, some means must be found of renewing the transition itself. It's a really remarkable passage. You could spend a long time dwelling on it. But I think the thing I'd particularly like to draw to your attention is that what he says happens in those moments where, where, where reading a piece of poetry suddenly uh, restores a kind of wholeness to your view of things is he's not saying it's a 
grim, dull, meaningless, pointless set of, you know, what Coleridge called, from Locke's point of view, an immense heap of little things out there. And that's pretty grim, but at least we've got some poetry to kind of compensate for it privately in our own little island in inner consciousness. He's not saying that at all. He's actually saying the experience of reading great poetry, particularly ancient poetry, uh, an ancient text, is that for a moment you see the world as other people saw it once, and that world is still there. You're, as it were, having put into your hands a new scientific instrument, like a better telescope. It's very interesting, one of the, the poets who I think has most absorbed some of this understanding, though not directly from Barfield, but um, as it were indirectly from Coleridge, uh, is the modern Welsh poet Gwyneth Lewis. And um, she's, she's got a superb sequence of poems called Zero Gravity, which is, amongst other things, about the repair of the Hubble Space Telescope. So it happened that her cousin was one of the astronauts that went up to, you know, they'd spent all this money on this great mir mirror up in space, and it just was slightly out of adjustment. <laughs> so they weren't getting... And they had to go out and have somebody physically kind of recalibrate it and adjust it. And as a result of which we had those astonishing and beautiful pictures. And she has a constant analogy between the subtle readjustment of this, this thing and what poetry itself is doing as a possibility for the way we perceive ourselves and our spirits. And that's a very, both a Coleridgean and Barfieldian way of seeing things. So, if we're making, this is me explaining Barfield, if we're making a transition if we're moving from one plane of consciousness to another as we read a piece of great poetry, we might reasonably ask, which is the plane we have lost and which is the plane we're gaining? Barfield believed that at least one mode of this change of consciousness enabled us to see the world in an older and more participative way, which he believed healed our alienation. And that is part of where both the pleasure and the power of poetry was to be felt. For Barfield, the access to forgotten truths which such a change of consciousness enables is vital as a counterbalance and corrective to the one-eyed view of reductive science. Um, so just as poetry and poetic metaphor gave us an access to this change of consciousness, so too he also believed going behind the poetry, the earliest poetry, the whole uh, realm of myths and mythology, so-called primitive myths, which are the subject, of course, of early poetry, also have something vital to teach us. Indeed, Barfield appeals to myth, um, particularly to the story of Odin, later in poetic diction, to make this very point. Now, you may remember, if you've read one version or another of the legends of Asgard, um, that in order to acquire knowledge, Odin made a sacrifice. First, hanging himself on the world tree, Yggdrasil, the steed of Odin, the great uh, ash tree that connected the nine worlds of Norse mythology. First, hanging himself on the world tree, and then, you remember, descending to its roots and offering to pluck out one of his own eyes in return for the knowledge of how to interpret the runic letters which the tree was writing with its roots. So... Barfield says this about modern science, extraordinary application of the myth, but very pertinent. Our sophistication, like Odin's, has cost us an eye. And now it is the language of poets, insofar as they create true metaphors, which must restore this lost unit concept un unity conceptually after it has been lost from perception. We see things that perhaps others couldn't have said, seen in other ages, but only by plucking out one of our eyes and looking at the others. So for Barfield, the great deposits of human poetic utterance in many languages over several millennia, to which we still have access in the foundational texts of the great religions and the mythologies, uh, oral mythologies of all the ancient peoples, um, in everything from our own Hebrew and Christian scriptures through to the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and through to the stories of the First Nations in, in the Americas, the great um, inheritance of those things. For Barfield, that great deposit of human poetic utterance in many languages to which we still have access is not simply some disposable cultural capital. 
It's not a series of records of purely subjective experience, nor, as Dawkins would have it, a series of incorrect versions of modern science. It is instead, for Barfield, part of the hard evidence we have of the changing interaction between consciousness and cosmos. More than that, it is still, for all of us, a mode of knowing which we would be foolish to ignore. As he says in the amazing concluding paragraph of Poetic Diction, without the continued existence of poetry, without a steady influx of new meaning into language, even the knowledge and wisdom which poetry herself has given in the past must wither away into a species of mechanical calculation. Great poetry is the progressive incarnation of life into consciousness. That's an astonishing thing to say. There's a whole other <laughs> time this evening to get into all of what that means. But uh, it's, a it's, it's a stunning thing when you read this because it's such a rejection of the fundamental division, the kind of, as I've called it in another place, the epistemological apartheid that we're living with at the moment, the separate development where we've got hard-edged, reductive, factual, quantitative, scientific knowledge over there, which is the real stuff that's actually the case. And then we've got this kind of quaint little Bantu stand over here of nice heritage, touchy-feely, subjective stuff that we're allowed to have, providing it doesn't impinge on anything like economics, you know, um, over here. And Barfield is saying, no, <laughs> we are casting aside and allowing to rust the very instruments which the past has given for understanding what is the case. Um, so, how might the insights from these two literary and philog philological books, um, History in English Words and uh, Poetic Diction, uh, be transferred to the realm of science, and particularly to the question of the relationships between science and spirituality or religion? I think most of Barfield's subsequent writings uh, endeavor to do just that, to make that transference. Barfield's next major work, really major work after Poetic Diction, a long gap, great deal of thinking in between, was Saving the Appearances in 1957. Saving the Appearances is subtitled A Study in Idolatry. It's really a work concerned with the way we know, with the relationship between thinking and imagination, language and perception, and with how all these relate to our awareness, both of the divine and of what it is to be human. Now, at its core, it's an account of the evolution of consciousness. The evolution of consciousness was an idea he'd first posited in history in English words. He'd been able to look at the evidence and say, look, the way we, we, the, the way we configure the world, the way we see things, has fundamentally changed. It's really clear from the fact that um, pneuma, and for that matter, ruach, which is the Hebrew equivalent of pneuma, or spiritus, which is the Latin equivalent of it, um, it's clear from the way those words are used in the ancient texts that the ancients simply did not have the experience that we now have of a meteorological activity devoid of meaning, which is predicted by weathermen and which you just get on with that they could never feel a, bre a, a breeze blow or draw in or exhale a breath without that being entirely filled with spirit, without that being an exchange of consciousnesses and a, a participation and exchange of being. Wind could not be anything other than spirit. The language makes that clear. It is equally clear that the spiritual could not be anything other than the exchanged and particular and physical. It is not the case that they had private, intellectual, abstract spiritual experiences and some poet went, oh, it's a bit like the breeze, really. I think I'll make that link. It's only when the thing has been separated out and we've, we've falsely created the idea of a, of a wind that isn't spiritual <laughs> that some poor poet has had to come in and do the reparation work and say, oh, well, look, I better make it a metaphor for the spirit because actually that's what it is. <laughs> do you see? Um, so he'd seen that there was, we did used to know in a different way and had direct access to a different level and kind of reality than we've given ourselves access to now, that we've narrowed the focus of our vision, that we've plucked out the eye. So, of course, it could have been, he could have ended up saying, well, 
gee, it was great then. I wish I'd been alive then. It's such a drag now. It's all going to the dogs, you know, end of story. Um, which, you know, might have been a temptation. But on the contrary, he began to see that the process wasn't over and to see that actually the plucked out either scientific knowledge might be quite important, but we, didn't, we need to find a way of recovering the other. And he began to think of a much bigger arc of this evolution and to see that we're in a story that's not over yet so that the later writing becomes filled with extraordinary hope. So, saving the appearances. Um, he goes on to say, there's a, so, so uh, you know, do, is it all gone, is it finished, or can we, can we recover something? So uh, there's a passage in, in the preface to the second edition of Poetic Diction, um, which argues uh, for a science, for a new science, for a, a new way of seeing on the basis of what we've discovered through these languages, which um, is almost prophetic of what he then comes to write in Saving the Appearances. So, so this is the, this is the uh, passage from the preface to the, to the second edition of, of Poetic uh, Addiction, which shows the kind of thinking that he'd begun to, to engage in. Science deals with the world which it perceives, but seeking more and more to penetrate the veil of naive perception progresses only towards the goal of nothing, because it still does not accept in practice whatever it may admit theoretically, that the mind first creates what it perceives as objects, including the instruments which science uses for that very penetration. It insists on dealing with data, but there shall be no data given save the bare percept. The rest is imagination. Only by imagination, therefore, can the world be known. What is needed is not only that larger and larger telescopes and more and more sensitive calipers should be constructed, but that the human mind should become increasingly aware of its own creative activity. That's a very far-reaching thing to say. He points out something which actually lots of people admit, but they just don't join up the knowledge. I mean, they've admitted it since Kant, actually, that... Um, what we perceive of the world, including all the stuff we study scientifically and look at through telescopes and microscopes, and I mean, physicists will tell you this straight away. It's not actually, you know, they'll, any physicist will tell you that this desk and is, is actually mainly space, you know, and that the appearance of its solidity and all of that is something that we experience as a result of a combination of the shape of our minds and the nature of our senses, and that, in fact, we do a great deal creatively of joining up, as it were, the, the, the dots of experience. And we all know that, you know, there's lots of drawings where you can have, see a half thing drawn and then you, you make the rest of the face. Uh, that there's a huge amount of us shaping the world that we perceive. But Western scientific knowledge has tried to ignore that completely. Um, I mean, I often use the example from my own experience of doing science in school as a child. I came into the English school system late and had never done, you know, proper science as the children were doing it there, as physics, chemistry, and biology. And, um, and uh, so I, my first experience of it was a, was a sort of third form chemistry lesson when the boys had already been taught how to write up the experiments. And I was just amazed and astonished by it all. And we were doing a really simple thing with litmus paper and putting it into the acid and alkali and it changed color. And we had to write the experiment up. And I wrote, I think, you know, one of my best early prose poems about this experience and how I took the litmus paper and I put it in and on marvelous. And I included all the facts that we'd done, you know. But I expressed my wonder at it. And it was my first chemistry homework. And of course, I was called up to the class when the homework came back and given a right dressing down. And every time I'd used the word I, had a red pen through it. And I was instructed by torturing the English language and using the passive voice that, you know, the litmus paper was immersed into the titration and it was observed that such and such. As though there'd been nobody to do it, nobody to observe it, nobody actually there, just the dry objective facts. And I was expected to swallow this fiction that the thing had happened with nobody there to be there. But actually, if there'd been nobody there, it wouldn't have happened. And my perception of the beauty of what it was was part of the event. Now, you know, obviously my chemistry teacher hadn't done any quantum physics and didn't understand the importance of the observer for all the, but do you, do you see that, that, that break? So, so Balfield is saying, if, we, if our perceiving mind is actually part of what's there, and part of how we know what's there, and part of what shapes what's there, then actually the imaginative part of our perceiving mind might be the most important part of it. We might even have some, some responsibility for the way we choose to imagine the world. 
that the way we choose to configure the world might have some considerable influence on what it is and how we treat it. The idea, so I'm continuing now um, my own explanation of this. The idea, uh, this idea of the mind helping to create the phenomena or appearances of the world it perceives is developed at length in saving the appearances. Of course, the idea that the phenomenal world we perceive is not at all the same thing as what is actually out there is not original to Barfield. It's a common place of post-Kantian philosophy, as Barfield himself points out. It's presumed at every point by modern physics. The world of particles and or waves described by modern physics is not at all the world of apparently solid objects, shape and color, which is our daily experience. To describe the active shaping that the human mind brings to its perception, Barfield, in that book, Saving the Appearances, uh, uses first the example and then the analogy of a rainbow. In answering the question, is a rainbow really there? Barfield reminds us that whilst the raindrops and the sun are there, the perception of the rainbow depends on the observer. And yet, the rainbow is not illusory in the sense of being a private illusion, because several people can see the representation of a bow in the sky together, even though at another level they recognize that the rainbow is not there, in the same sense that the water droplets or the sunlight are there. The rainbow is, as Barfield says, a shared or collective representation. Now, Barfield, having used that example of the rainbow, then turns it into an analogy. And he asks us this time not to look at a rainbow, but at a tree. I think that just as a rainbow is the outcome of the raindrops and my vision, so a tree is the outcome of the particles and my vision and my other sense perceptions. Whatever the particles themselves may be thought to be, the tree, as such, is a representation. And the difference for me between a tree and a complete hallucination of a tree is the same as a difference between a rainbow and a hallucination of a rainbow. In other words, a tree which is really there is a collective representation. Now, this distinction between particles and representation and the color corollary from it that all phenomena or appearances are representations and therefore all appearances are at least in part the creation of the human mind informs everything else that Barfield says. For he argues that although this distinction is theoretically accepted, both in philosophy and physics, it is for all practical purposes completely ignored when we come to do our biology or our geology, and especially when we come to make assumptions about the nature of the world before human consciousness, a world which by definition could not contain any of the actual phenomena or appearances which our present science seeks to study, because there was no human consciousness to observe them. Um, so we believe. Um, Barfield's book asks a sustained acceptance by the reader, this is a quotation, a sustained acceptance by the reader of the relation assumed by physical sciences to subsist between human consciousness on the one hand and on the other the familiar world of which that consciousness is aware. Most science and history, in Barfield's view, conveniently forgets this relation. So as Barfield says at the beginning of the Saving the Appearances, the greater part of this book consists of a rudimentary attempt to remedy the omission of the man-nature relationship. But this involves challenging the assumption that that man-nature relationship has remained static. The result, and really the substance of this book, is a short outline or sketch for a history of human consciousness particularly the consciousness of Western humanity during the last 3,000 years or so. Small topic. Now, uh, this is where the book gets really radical, and I can't quite... But Barfield says, if the appearances, the things we regard as normally in the world, are there's something there, 
He's not a solipsist, there is something there. But that what we think of as the world that we perceive is, to, is at least partly shaped by our mind and our consciousness, yeah? which I think is taken as read. But if it is the case, which we know from the history of language, that our mind and consciousness are not fixed, they're changing the mode, then the world that we see, the appearances world, maybe not the things behind it, but the appearances world, is also changing. Now that's really radical. That, for a moment, gives you the exciting thought that when Homer sees Neptune rising out of the sea, or when he perceives the gods of the winds in Aeolus, in, it's not that he saw the dull things that we see and invented a god. He saw the god. That the very shaping of the mind shaped the thing, and that there was an exchange between. That that, that extraordinary, numinous, meaning, not only meaning-drenched, but person-drenched, personal, relational, multi-conscious world of the gods and the angels and, and who clothed themselves for a moment in human appearances, that that, it's not that somebody kind of, you know, had a big night out, you know, on, on, on the mead and wrote a poem about it the next morning, but, it, but actually they really saw that stuff and it was as much there as we can claim, you know, our idea that everything is just a dry mixture of dull things decaying, you know, is that actually, the, the, do you see, the, 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 we, we we're shaping these things as they actually are. We have that, as he puts it in another place, creatively directional relation with the world. And it makes a big difference how we think about the world as to how the world actually is back to us. So um, I love this. It's an outline sketch of the history of human consciousness. A key term in it is the idea of participation. Participation is the opposite of alienation. And what he begins to suggest towards the end of that book, is that we can begin to move towards a more participatory mode of seeing the world. How am I doing for time? You're glancing uh, at me. Five minutes. Uh, OK, right. So um, that book and subsequent ones open up really, really exciting possibilities. And I want to close by, by um, commenting on um, some very interesting historical remarks and then prophetic remarks that uh, Barfield makes about major paradigm shifts. Um, he partly draws on a very famous and, 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 and justly well-cited book by a Kuhn called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And Barfield points to a couple of really major shifts in the way we as human beings have configured and imagined the world around us, and the way that imagination has then actually affected the things we see, as it were, and affected our observations. So he talks about um, the uh, shift uh, from uh, an Aristotelian mode of thinking, which had the, un then Aristotle, you remember, had the idea of the unmoved mover, but Aristotle believed that everything else that moved, consciously moved in a relation to something else, that everything, as it were, was moved by love in the end, and that the spheres turned because they, they, they yearned to be with the sphere above them. And that that's why the words motion and emotion are actually related in our language, and why we speak about being moved in more than one way or the other. That we still have an inner and outer for move, but Barfield says we'll soon lose the inner, and moving will no longer be moving. It'll just be setting things in mechanical motion. One of the last places where we get them both beautifully is in Coleridge's lovely line in the Ancient Mariner, where he says, the moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide. And the moving moon is moving in the sense that it's moving through space, but it's moving the mariner, it's moving the sea, it is itself something which moves the whole meaning of the poem. Um, so there was a big shift from the Aristotelian participative uh, engaged conscious way of seeing the world to a mechanistic way in which you have a law of gravity rather than a law of motion as, as, as meaningful motion. Um, then there's another major shift, which is the, the, the famous one between the, um, the heliocentric and the geocentric, the geocentric and the heliocentric view. So if you thought the Earth was the center of things, then you configured everything in one way, and then uh, you realize, no, actually, you can make a better account of the observations, the appearances, if you think of it the other way. 
But what uh, Kuhn pointed out in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, is when an old theory, an old consensus, an old way of fixed way of seeing things, which was a human construct, but it's been around for so long that nobody thinks it's a human construct anyway. They think it's just an iron scientific law. When, when one of those is getting ready to break, what happens is you get a series of new observations which don't fit the old mold. And the scientific establishment of the old mold, whatever it is, completely ignore them and don't publish any of the papers about it. And then when eventually the observations are too many to deny, they come up with increasingly elaborate theories to account for the new observations under the old system. And it was wonderful when they, you know, the brilliant and ingenious attempts to account for novas and to account for the observation of the movement of heavenly bodies while still seeing the Earth as the center and the sun going around. It was absolutely brilliant until eventually you couldn't do it anymore. And somebody, you know, kind of Copernicus had to come along and say, just imagine it this way. Suppose it was this. Let's, and then suddenly the new model makes complete sense of all the observations. But for a while, about five people understand it. And everybody else is going on with the old view. And in fact, we're still going on. We still talk about sunrise and sunset, don't we? We don't say earth turn, which is what it actually is. So he observes that when there's a big shift coming, there's a few people get it. There's a lot of real observations that are underprivileged and not noticed. And then eventually there's a leap and a new sense is made of things. But that the leap and the new sense are always preceded by an increasing sense of crisis and desperation. And he believes, writing in the 70s, that we are about to undergo just such a change that the previous consensus that there is no mind out there and that mind in here is only an accident that's kind of rolling around meaninglessly in the concavity of our skulls and will soon be extinguished, um, which is a very peculiar, and you know, it's a view that's only been going on in the West for about 300 years, you know, and that it, he thinks it's had its day. It just doesn't account, you know, we cannot account for consciousness um, simply mechanistically, but that we've got such a huge investment in a purely reductive and mechanistic way of seeing things, that every time we get any kind of observational phenomenon that doesn't fit with it, we just ignore it. But there comes a point where there's too many to ignore. And he gives a brilliant account, uh, which is what perhaps I'll close with, of, of uh, the way those changes come and the way he feels they're coming now, uh, which again seems to me to, to put its finger on just where we are. So um, this is why he, he calls the current way we see things the Cartesian paradigm. The Cartesian paradigm, because Cart, Cart, Descartes defined man as a thinking substance, said, I think man. And you remember Cart, De, Descartes, the most significant division in knowledge that Descartes made, which we're still working with, is between two kinds of, of being, a res uh, in, intellectual, I think it's called, in, intellectual, I can't remember. The, you know, there's thinking stuff, which is only in us. He thought probably in the pineal gland. And um, then there's extensive stuff, stuff out in space, but that, that doesn't think. And that's the big division. And he thinks that's coming to an end. This is what he says. The frozen mass on which the, he, he, de, he depicts us as camping on the surface of an ice cap that is about to melt. A frozen mass on which the psychological and physical structure of our technological civilization is erected and into which are embedded deep down foundations determining even the minor details of the edifice they support. That mass consists of a collective conviction, mainly subliminal, subliminal and by now amounting to a certainty, that nature is an objective system which man can only affect by manipulation from without, and that each individual man is separate uh, as a separate part of, of that kind of nature. That is the mass, and its surface at first sight looks firm enough. Yet for those with eyes to see, there are a good many indications that it is not nearly as firm as it looks. And further, that the likelihood of the mass as a whole continuing solid is being seriously threatened, both from above and below. Cracks are appearing in the surface where the foundation first became visible to the naked eye as the result of impacts from above, while from the opposite direction the frozen mass itself appears to be growing thinner, becoming more like the crust than a mass, as it is thawed by a gradual increasing warmth uprising from the depths below. The impacts from above represent the instinctive human reactions against the results of our critical, uh, uh, uncritical objectivity that has dominated intellectual life for the last two or three centuries. The warmth from below result represents the beginning of the criticism 
And he thinks the whole thing that we've seen as this solid way of dividing the world up is changing in the face of a change of consciousness. And he thinks we're the generation that are living through that. And that one of the ways in which we'll work our way through it and recover knowledge is actually by remembering and participating in the knowledge of poetry. Thank you. I'll stop there.